moment to introduce Chapter 5, Gases. So you should know that the noble gases, as indicated by their name, are gases at STP, or ordinary conditions of temperature and pressure. You should also know which of the diatomic elements are gases. Out of Hofbrinkel, um, only hydrogen, nitrogen, oxygen, fluorine, and chlorine are gases. Bromine's a liquid, and iodine is a solid under STP conditions. There's also a lot of different molecular compounds, which are common gases, like ammonia, carbon monoxide, carbon dioxide, methane. If you think about what these have in common, you'll see that they're composed entirely of nonmetals, and they have simple molecular formulas with low molar masses. In this chapter, you might also hear the word vapor. A vapor is referring to the gas phase, but referring to the gas phase for a substance that you don't ordinarily think of as a gas under ordinary conditions, like water you think of as liquid. So when we talk about water vapor, water in the gas phase, you might hear the term vapor. Gases have neither a definite volume nor a definite shape. They take that of the container, and that's because the attractive forces are very minimal between the particles. So they spread out and take um, up the volume of the container. We usually assume that the particles move independently of one another. So remember, solids have a definite shape, definite volume, a regular geometric pattern. Liquids, um, though they are close together, the particles are mobile, and they start spreading out more, so they take the shape of the container, though they have their own volume. Gases take the shape and volume of the container, very spread apart, randomly moving. Gases are highly compressible, meaning they compress or expand to occupy the full volume of their containers. Gases uniformly fill any container. Since they uniformly fill their container, if you put more than one gas into a container, they will always form a homogeneous mixture. Gases only occupy about 0.1% of the volume of their container. Um, gases have extremely low densities, just to give you um, a comparison about um, if you're comparing the gas to its equivalent liquid or solid, it's about 1 1,000th the density. They're fluid and flow. They diffuse and effuse, which we'll learn about in this chapter, and they exert pressure on the surroundings. You should know the definition of temperature. Temperature is a measure of the average kinetic energy, or the energy of motion, of the particles in the substance. So it's um, kind of a measure of how fast your particles are moving. Higher temperature, the particles are moving faster. It's measured by a thermometer. If you're ever asked a question about kinetic energy, you are looking at the temperature. So which has the greatest kinetic energy? You're looking at here, um, whichever has the greatest temperature would have the higher kinetic energy. It's independent of the mass, independent of the substance. I'm only looking at the temperature to give me information about the kinetic energy. If they had the same temperatures, they would have the same kinetic energy. Pressure is the amount of force exerted per unit area. In a container, gas par particles are constantly moving, so we can think of pressure as the collisions that are happening, um, the force that they are exerting due to col them colliding with the container wall. So they collide with each other and they collide with the container. So anything that would increase the number of collisions would increase the pressure that that gas exerts. Pressure is measured by a barometer, and even the air above us exert a pressure. We call this atmospheric pressure. So you can use a mercury barometer to measure pressure, and this was how uh, one of the original units of pressure was uh, found, uh, millimeters of mercury. So what they did was they took this tube that's closed at one end, filled it entirely with mercury, which is a liquid at room temperature, and inverted it in a container a, or a dish filled with mercury as well. And what they noticed is that all of the mercury did not come out. There was always some column of mercury still inside. And this corresponds to the atmospheric pressure. Essentially, the pressure is exerting a force down onto this dish as well, which keeps some of the mercury into this tube. So the height of this column is going to be indicative of atmospheric pressure. The, the larger the height, the larger the pressure. Um, and what so they came up with the unit millimeters of mercury. Okay. At higher altitudes, the atmospheric pressure would be lower, so this would be a lower column of mercury. Standard atmospheric pressure um, supports a column of mercury 760 millimeters high. So uh, 760 millimeters of mercury is standard atmospheric pressure. So there's a lot of different units of pressure. Uh, notice that torr and millimeters of mercury are kind of interchangeable. Um, 
because it's called Tor after the scientist Torshielli who came up with this. There's KPA, kilopascals, there's pascals, there's VAR, there's PSI or pounds per square inch is what that stands for, and there's atmospheres, which is abbreviated ATMs as well. So on your AP formula sheet, you will have this part of this. One atmosphere is equal uh, 760 millimeters of mercury or 760 tor. So these are only the conversions you would be needing to use on the AP, though in your textbook um, you might need some of these conversions that are listed here in your notes. So you might want to pause the video, take a moment, and try this example here. For the first, it is saying, okay, 2.5 atmospheres, let's change this into tor. So I can use via dimensional analysis 760 tors equivalent to one atmosphere, make that my conversion factor, and I get about 1900 tor. In the second, um, I can convert 33 kPa, um, and these two things are equivalent to each other, so let's put this into a conversion factor, and I get about 248 millimeters of mercury. Okay. Um, you might see problems involving a manometer. A manometer looks something like this, where you have this bulb containing a gas, and then it's connected to this kind of U-tube, which is then exposed to the atmosphere. And within this U-tube, um, you might have a liquid. Typically, it would be a liquid of um, mercury, though it could be something else. Uh, but in the problems you see, it would be mercury, since mercury in millimeters of mercury, as you know, is a measurement of pressure. So essentially, what you do in these manometer problems is you see that there would be a difference in height from one side of the column mercury to the other. And this difference in height is going to be a measure of the difference in pressures between the atmosphere and the gas. So when you're doing these kinds of problems, um, you kind of want to either look at the description, if there's no picture, just read the description or look at the picture and see what's pressing harder. So if I look at this first image, this get and I look at kind of the YouTube, the gas is pressing here on this column of mercury and the atmosphere is pressing here. What is pressing harder? The gas must be pressing harder, which is causing this mercury to shift. That's why this end is lower here. So whichever side has the lower side of the mercury column is pressing harder. So the pressure of the gas is higher than the pressure of the atmosphere. So what I want to do for a situation like this is set up an equation like this. The pressure of the gas equals the pressure of the atmosphere plus the height. The plus the height should be on the side with the atmosphere since the gas, oops, sorry, since the gas has a higher uh, pressure than that of the atmosphere. If I look at this here, this is the opposite situation. Here is the, pre the atmosphere is pressing, here the gas is pressing. Here the atmosphere is pressing harder, which is causing this mercury to shift toward the gas. It has the lower side. So if I see a situation where the manometer looks like this, I want um, the pressure of the gas, I want to subtract the height from the pressure of the atmosphere. Essentially, overall, I want the pressure of the atmosphere to be higher than that of the gas. So always ask yourself, which side is pressing harder? That side exerts more pressure. Okay, so I subtract the height from the atmosphere if the gas is um, pressing less, if the atmosphere is pressing harder, and I would add it to the atmosphere if um, I need the gas to be higher. When, just as a note, when you're adding or subtracting pressures, make sure that they're in the same unit. So if I'm subtracting the height in millimeters of mercury, the pressure of the atmosphere should be in millimeters of mercury. Um, so if you don't have the same units, you're going to have to do a conversion first. Okay. Here's a question. What would be the relationship between the pressure of the gas and the pressure of the atmosphere in a picture that looks like this? Okay, here they have the same height. So the pressure of the gas would equal the pressure of the atmosphere. Okay, in this situation, take or this example, take a moment, try it, pause the video, and then we can check your work. So this is telling me if I first of all, if I look at the picture, what's pressing harder? The gas is pressing harder. So when I set up my equation, I want to find the pressure of the atmosphere, if it make sure it's in the correct unit that I want, and I want to add the height. Okay? So in here, I give you the diff I don't give you the difference in height. I give you the height of each side. So take a moment and find the difference, 39.8 millimeters of mercury. 
Okay, the atmospheric pressure is in torr, which is essentially the same thing as millimeters of mercury, so there's no um, conversion I need right now. I can just add the height to 764.2 torr, and I get that the pressure of the gas is 804 torr. Just notice that the problem asked me for the pressure of the gas in kPa, so I just need a conversion based on the conversions that you have on a previous slide, and I find that I have 107.2 kPa. Again, notice that my pressure of the gas, let's just check if this makes sense, if I look at it in Tor, my pressure of the gas is 804, should it be higher than the pressure of the atmosphere? Yeah. It should, because the gas is pressing harder. So it makes sense that I added the height. Okay. Take a moment and try this example doing the same information, but notice that the picture is reversed. And then pause the video and check your work. So if this were the case, the atmospheric pressure is pressing harder. So rather than adding H when finding pressure of the gas, I want to subtract the height and I would get 724.4 torr, and if I turn that to kPa, I get 96.6 kPa, a lower pressure than that of the atmosphere, which makes sense, according to this diagram. If you're given a textbook problem and it doesn't have a picture, it might be helpful to draw a picture for yourself.